Good evening, everyone. Good evening, good evening. Hello and welcome to the Arboricultural Association's headquarters here in Stonehouse in the UK. My name is John Parker. I'm technical director at the association and I'm very, very pleased that you could join us tonight. Please use the chat to say hello. Many of you are already doing so. Tell us where you're watching from, but please remember all panellists and attendees is the option you want to select. Otherwise, only we can see it and everybody else can't see you or where you're from. What a wasted opportunity that will be. So please make sure you select the right option. Uh, submit your questions through the Q&A button and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. We have got a very exciting lineup for you tonight, which will be all about community engagement with trees, with presentations from Greg Packman, Sarah Shawley, and Russell Miller. Greg will be telling you all about the Urban Tree Festival in his presentation, but I'll also mention it now. You should definitely check it out. Go and look at the Urban Tree Festival website to find out more about what's going on there between May the 15th and the 23rd. This webinar tonight is a sort of early Urban Tree Festival collaboration, um, which is great. But our webinar next week is specifically intended to be part of not only our normal Wednesday webinar program, but also part of the Urban Tree Festival. We're going to be joined by authors Tracy Chevalier and Jonathan Drury for Tree Stories, Heart, Mind and Soul. As ever, it's free to join and you can register following the link that will appear in the chat now. And finally, I hope you've been following the Urban Tree World Cup, where there have already been plenty of nail-biting matches. Today's fixture is a battle of the chestnuts, horse chestnut versus sweet chestnut. You can vote on Twitter or on our website. Links will be put in the chat. I can tell you it's pretty tight at the moment on Twitter anyway. It's 48 to 52 in favour of sweet chestnut on Twitter, but on the website, sweet chestnut's got a much bigger lead. So if you're a horse chestnut fan, your team needs you. Go voting. Um, so get involved with that, please. And finally, 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 a virtual ARB show exhibitor booking is now open. So if you fancy having a virtual stand at the virtual event, which is coming at the end of this month, then please do get in touch. And again, you can find links and such like on the chat. Right. We're soon going to be hearing from Sarah and Russell. But first of all, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the association's virtual stage, Mr. Greg Packman. Greg, it's over to you. Thank you very much, John. Cool, right. So, yeah, as John very kindly mentioned, I'm here talking about the Urban Tree Festival, but it's also talking about, um, well, community tree festivals themselves, but also online events. So, kind of starting off, so really, what actually is the Urban Tree Festival? Well, although the name does describe it very, very well. It's essentially a community-based celebration of urban trees. And it's specifically about urban trees rather than rural woodland or, or forest. And it's predominantly aimed at connecting people with their local urban trees. Because as more and more people live in urban areas, um, even though there are a lot of trees in urban areas, people really have never been more disconnected from trees and tree knowledge and access to nature and trees as well so it's it's aimed as an event to really bridge the gaps between communities and to engage them with their their local urban trees and it started off quite a few years ago as london tree week which is a, a more official event i think run by the greater london authority but when they sort of ceased to run it uh, a few of the groups found the members decided to keep it going and it became the urban tree festival which started off as just like a day and weekend event, but it's, it's actually grown and become much more successful. And if I've got this wrong to any other organisations or groups and apologies, but it's one of the few or only events dedicated purely to celebrating urban trees. Well, I know that you have, obviously there's National Tree Week and various other events. They cover trees all across the UK, but this is specifically and only for urban trees. Sort of the you know the trees and streets, urban parks and urban woodlands. Because as I mentioned before, although you know, we all have a lot of these in our town cities, there's not a great deal actually going on, or historically hasn't been, to really sort of promote and celebrate these trees. And while we started off doing real life events, sort of guided walks, group presentations, uh, indoor activities, last year, like the rest of the world, we were forced to transition to an online existence, and actually it proved to be a really successful format last year. 
because it meant that rather than just reaching London, where we started, we were able to reach all across the country and internationally, and much like the Art Association webinars, and also where people have accessibility issues or financially can't always afford to get involved in these things, all of our events were free, and it meant that people could access nature where they could from their living rooms, from their computers. So sort of looking at why the Urban Tree Festival works, why it's been successful. In recent years, especially in the last sort of five or ten, there's been a really growing awareness of urban trees and, and their importance. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail about why urban trees are important. I think everybody here probably knows the reasons why. But as more and more people live in urban areas, and that is something that's predicted to increase dramatically over the next 50 years, you could argue that the living conditions of urban areas are going to be even more important. And you know, trees are one of the best and cheapest ways of improving um, urban life in urban areas. So raising that awareness and connecting those people is really, really key and crucial. And also, it's not an arboricultural event, because if it was, we'd be you know, competing up against the really, really big players like the Woodland Trust, the Tree Councils and the Arbor Association. But instead, we're uh, a cross-sector group of enthusiasts and professionals. I'm the only person in the arboricultural industry um, involved in the day-to-day -day running of this event, and it's made up of um, ecologists, authors, landscape architects, um, yoga practitioners, artists, there's people from all walks of life in the, involved in the Urban Tree Festival, and it's sort of quite reflective of you know, the urban populations that were far, far more diverse and wide-ranging than a group of uh, tree specialists. Although, of course, keeping that knowledge there is, is very crucial as well. But what I think also is very important is it really bridges a gap between communities and professionals and shares tree knowledge. Because there are sadly too many examples where relationships between the public and tree professionals can be very antagonistic. Be it a resident wanting a tree cut down because it's blocking their TV signal, or a local group who really don't like their council anymore because they felled some of their local trees for whatever reason. Whereas this provides a format and a platform for community groups and professionals to interact away from those work conflicts and actually sort of build bridges and um, you know, share knowledge. And it you know, enables people like myself to talk to tree enthusiasts and non-tree specialists to sort of give them a, a tree management and local authority perspective. And then also, you know, I've been in the, in the industry for 10 years or more than that. So I'm very much, I've got an arboricultural focus in my thinking. And there's times where I might not always appreciate what the average member of the public uh, might think. And we have, because of our arboriculture involvement, it's really enabled that sort of sharing of perspectives and knowledge. And it's something that's worked really, really well. And also this is really important that it connects not just professionals and members of the public, but it connects groups and individuals to each other through our events we've managed to connect various sort of tree groups across London across the country to each other who can sort of help each other and share knowledge as well as you know, meeting a really really good group of individuals who are really into trees I think it's one of Ted Green's favorite phrases is a friendship formed under a tree lasts a lifetime or something along those lines and it's yeah using trees to you know, interact and engage people with each other, especially when living in urban areas, can be a very lonely existence at times. And we're very fortunate to have had great support from the Arbor Association, the Woodland Trust, Greater London Authority, uh, Tree Council, Trees for Cities, in, in helping us connect the public to urban trees. Because it's kind of a lot has been put into sort of rural work, traditional woodlands and forests. But again, it's that urban perspective with trees has been overlooked for quite a long time. And it's one, for me, one of the most important areas is to really try and work with community groups to connect those charities, professionals and enthusiasts to hopefully get a better deal for trees. So here's just an example of one of the activities we had, I think in 2019. So this was an education event with a school, I forget which, I think it was in South London somewhere, where it was using Sort of art and creativity and nature to really engage children who hadn't been outdoors, well, obviously they had been outdoors, but not out in nature 
experiencing nature properly and they absolutely loved this event so the one that was really really successful and this is a really fantastic concept the leaf motif from save our street trees in northampton who are a fantastic group and this is something that's almost changed in the online world is that this is using the mandala concept to create leaf motifs and sort of share it and connect people on social media while also giving them a great activity to do getting involved with nature and trees and i'm sure everyone can appreciate this is that when you, you physically interact with leaves with trees it just builds such a deeper experience so the leaf motif thing i think is a, a fantastic uh, concept and online activity and it's something that you can you can do you can go on twitter and share hashtag leaf motif any uh, leaf motifs you, you might create and then this was an event that we ran again back in 2019 that was our last physical um, urban tree festival because of coronavirus and lockdown and this this was a walk in south london i think in Southwark, where they had planted out a new road full of uh, yoshino cherries and in this example the lady just to the right of the middle with the hand gestures she's a local councillor and in that group, we had the councillors, we had members of the public, and we had tree professionals as well. And this is one of those seemingly few and rare occasions where those three groups, tree professionals, the public, and local councillors, can actually interact in a really, really fantastic way, where there's kind of no other issues. They're all there celebrating trees, and it just fills those bridges. And, uh, well, uh, the, the flower on Yoshino cherries is always a always a crowd pleaser so this was yeah this is a really great example of a really lovely successful walk where we managed to sort of build connections between three different groups um, and it just led to positive outcomes from tree management and planting in the area and yeah my bit's only quite brief today but just an example of the range of events that we're going to be running over the tree festivals that we have a daily tree rings webinar series on a whole variety of themes, including access to nature, tree blossom, like the Yishino cherry, uh, trees and climate change later in the week, as well as campaigning for trees as well. And that's been a huge part of the urban relationship with trees in the last few years is the rise of these campaign groups. And some of them like Stag in Sheffield, Save Our Street Trees in, in Northampton, have actively really positively changed the way that their local areas trees have been managed. I think in the case of Northampton, it's actually managed to get a new tree officer in post, or that's the plan at least. Um, I won't talk about tree musketeers, but because Russell will be talking about them. But where these campaign groups have worked, it's actually delivered a better result overall for the tree management in those areas, which I think is fantastic. And very sort of related to this presentation is that our headline event this Saturday, 6 p.m., if you don't feel like going down to the pub just yet, you can check this out on Saturday. That's a focus on, on some of these community groups that I mentioned, sort of how they work, how they've been successful, and their work with local authorities. And some of these groups, I think, are fantastic models that can be replicated across the country, that interface between the public and local authorities. And that's a huge part of what the Urban Tree Festival hopes to achieve. Um, a great event as well on Sunday is the wonder of ancient trees featuring lynn body and jill butler both of whom are involved in the uh, fungi symposium that they're very kindly doing presentations for us on yeah, ancient trees and fungi and this would be an especially relevant event to anyone working with trees in london is an amazing company called saunders seasonings who take the timber from london fell trees in london and rather than it going off to be firewood or biofuel it's actually converted into really high quality timber. So this is a presentation of theirs on Monday, sort of how they, well, essentially how they give these trees a second life. And it's, uh, it's also really, really important in terms of climate, is it's a sustainable use of timber as well. And then one of the events I'm very much looking forward to is the True Tree of London, which is going to be a debate between the Hornbeam and the London Plain to see who is the True Tree of London. But I won't tell you why it's those trees you'll have to book on to find out but um, yeah, that's my kind of very brief introduction to the festival and this webinar. But it's, it really is supposed just to talk about the importance of 
why as a tree professional reaching out and engaging with community groups is is so important because both sides have a lot of really valuable knowledge that needs to be interacted and shared because it's the only way we can really achieve a positive result for trees is by working collaboratively rather than in lots of different sort of silos but um yeah i'll pass back to john thank you very much Brilliant. Thank you very much, Greg. And uh, I mean, yeah, Greg's done loads of work over the last few years to, to do exactly what he's just talked about there and engaging the general public with trees. And it's, it's brilliant stuff. So Greg is going to be staying with us to answer all of your questions, whether it's related to the Urban Tree Festival or anything else you would like to ask. But first of all, I would very much like to hand over to our I was going to say first speaker, let's say second speaker. I am counting you, Greg. Our second speaker, Sarah. Sarah, it's over to you. Well, I think uh, it's been really nice to follow on from Greg, who's covered a, a lot of points I kind of want to raise as well around that community engagement, everyone coming together, partners on both sides. But um, just to cover who I am, I'm Sarah Shawley. I'm Urban Projects Officer at the Woodman Trust. Um, and my role is really around connecting people in trees, uh, just like Greg's been talking about just now. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Woodland Trust, uh, we're the UK's largest woodland conservation charity. We turn 50 next year, and the Trust was born from a community-led campaign to save a local woodland. And really, over the past five decades, we've continued to work uh, with communities to campaign on a range of issues for woods and trees. Uh, and in that time, we've acquired over a thousand woods, of which around about 30% are in urban areas. Um, we plant millions of trees every year and we campaign and lobby government for the change needed to achieve our organisation's mission, which is uh, a UK rich in woods and trees for people and for wildlife. And that really is a mission that we can't achieve alone. We need to work with partners and communities and people really are central to everything that we do. Um, I thought I'd refer back to a presentation that was made last week and uh, Cecil Caninendyke, when asked what his favourite book was, uh, gave Landscape and Memory by Simon Sharma and said, you can learn about urban forestry, but first you need to understand people and culture. And whilst I don't profess to know everything about people and culture or about trees, I know that both of them need to go hand in hand. They're essentially uh, one of the same thing. Um, I'm going to start with this magnificent oak tree. This tree is the Grantham Oak. Uh, it's affectionately known as such. It's in the hometown of the Woodland Trust, Grantham. Um, this tree uh, is, is a real, it's a real centerpiece for the local community. It's at the heart of a, a local um, housing development and residents do adore this tree. Uh, my colleague, Denise uh, Tegadine, has campaigned and worked with local residents to secure protections for this street tree, uh, making sure that the roots are protected. Uh, she noticed that utilities companies were parking, uh, working close to the tree and cars were parking on the roots. Um, and I think that's the symbol of how we've come to kind of lose that connection to trees. We, we've lost that sort of respect um, for the fact that they are living beings. And, and you know, we, we park on them, we, we we mow and strim them. We, we've kind of lost that connection to them as living beings. And the Grantham Oaks are a really nice example of how we've worked with the local community in Grantham and with the council to secure better protections for this tree. And that has culminated last week in the oak tree being added to the Grantham Trail, uh, Heritage Trail. This sign affectionately says Grantham's oldest resident. And I think that sums up really well uh, what trees are? They're our residents, they're our neighbours. We look at them every day from our windows, hopefully, if we're lucky enough to have trees on our streets. Um, and residents, I think, is, is a good way to consider them. And definitely uh, the way we feel that communities uh, feel about their trees from, from the campaigns that we see them running. Whilst the Grantham Oak is a lovely story uh, of affection and, and celebration of a tree, uh, and Grantham Oak actually won our Tree of the Year competition last year. This is the Happy Man Tree in London, also very affectionately uh, regarded by the local community. The Happy Man Tree won our Tree of the Year competition, but was sadly felled shortly after this photo was taken and, and after winning the competition. Um, it was felled for a development um, that the local council had secured. 
And the developer actually um, owned up and said, you know, if we'd known the strength of feeling for this tree when we were designing our scheme, we would have designed this tree in from the start. But unfortunately, the strength of feeling from the local community wasn't understood. And uh, as a result, that, that tree was lost. And I think it, it, it sends a really powerful message for talking to people and understanding how they feel about the trees on their doorsteps before we, before we step in and uh, take them away or, or manage them in a way that the local community don't understand. So, I mean, the Happy Man tree is a really good example of where my remit at the Wooden Trust often begins, and that's often at the point of conflict. Um, often at the point where a decision or an action involving the loss or retention of a tree or, or a group of trees uh, is the cause of dispute, upset, anger, and a whole range of other emotions. Um, and in fact, Woodland, Woodland Trust receives hundreds in, of inquiries every year from concerned members of the public uh, who turn to the Woodland Trust for help. Uh, and I think that was summed up by one local member of the community recently who said, it's just good to know there are fell busters we can call. I was trying to look for the Ghostbusters, but with a tree symbol. Um, I think that's the closest I'll ever get to feeling like a superhero. Um, but we know that really the heroes are the trees and all of those involved in caring for, protecting for them and standing up for them. Um, and all of those involved in collectively planting and, and establishing them. Um, my role really at Woodland Trust and, and working for the Trust Urban Team is conflict resolution. It's both working with communities and supporting them to stand up for their trees, um, but also working with tree professionals and councils and other organisations to, to navigate the conflict that we see um, and to work towards a future where fell busters absolutely are not needed. Um, Woodland Trust Urban Team was formed in 2016 following a surge of interest and demand for our support in urban areas. Um, we're a small team, there's just two of us, and we sit within the Trust's wider campaigning team. Uh, but our remit is organisationally cross-cutting, um, so we work closely with our government affairs colleagues, our conservation, our engagement and outreach colleagues to amplify the voices of communities and to push for better policies at both a local and a national level um, in respect of tree planting, care and protection. And I think over the past four years, in, in the range of communities we've worked with, the inquiries we've received and uh, the work that we've done, we've had some real insight into just how important that community engagement angle is um, and I want to share just a few case studies with you just to, to highlight exactly why it's so important. Many of you uh, may recognise some of the pictures here and will have heard of the controversial street tree felling in Sheffield. Um, the surge in interest for our support in urban areas was largely primarily triggered by the mass felling of street trees in Sheffield known as the Sheffield uh, Tree Massacre. I think the, the pictures here really sum up that the, the feeling that arose in Sheffield and the strength of feeling that residents demonstrated towards their trees. In Sheffield, over a period of five years, more than 5,000 street trees, many of them healthy, were removed as a result of a PFI contract uh, between Sheffield City Council and its contractor, Amy. Um, ultimately, it came to light following a series of freedom of information requests that around half of the city's trees uh, were due to be felled during the life of the contract. Um, around 17,500 trees in total. Um, and local residents decided that, you know, that could not happen. Um, so they formed local campaign groups and uh, established those across the city. And those were eventually coordinated under a united group called STAG, Sheffield Tree Action Group, who Greg referred to in his talk. Um, STAG formed in 2015 and really led the campaigns in Sheffield. And the Chelsea Road Elm here is just one of the trees that they managed to save through their campaigning. The Chelsea Road Elm is uh, home to a rare white letter hair streak butterfly. Um, and this event here was just one of a number of events and creative ways that the community came together to celebrate and raise awareness of the issue. And, you know, some of the community groups that are out there, there was a group called Street Tree Art Sheffield who engaged residents in drawing and painting the trees and really just showing that love and affection for them. Um, and I think that was a really important way for residents to demonstrate their strength of feeling. Um, just for a bit more context, in 2017, the Forestry Commission began an investigation into the, the legality of the fellings in Sheffield. Um, and in 2019, published the results, which fell short of a legal challenge, but was highly critical and for good reason. And the Vernon Oak, which is a famous tweeting tree in Sheffield, 
is a good example of why. Um, this tree was one of the many due to be felled, but um, despite assurances that felling was a last resort, uh, th this, uh, this tree was saved because of a, an alternative engineering solution that we didn't see um, on many of the 5,000 trees that were lost, but that could have been used. And it was thanks to the tireless campaigning of the community that highlighted that these alternative options were available um, before felling. But from where we've come from, that place of conflict um, and uh, strength of feeling, a new street tree partnership was formed in 2019 to look at ways for the council and the community to work together uh, with Amy um, and organisations, including Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust and Woodland Trust, to look to a more positive future for relationships in the city and tree management. And that partnership has really worked very hard uh, over the past uh, couple of years to create a new street tree strategy for Sheffield. And what you can see here is the working strategy that was launched in August last year. And that strategy was open to consultation for members of the public, local businesses, organisations um, and tree professionals to respond to and give their thoughts. Um, and that consultation closed in October. And since that time, the partnership has worked hard to build in any comments that were given um, and to create a, a final version of the strategy that is going to be released imminently anytime soon. This strategy is supported by a new tree warden scheme that will be led by Amy, um, the council's contractor. And that tree warden scheme is going to see a network of tree wardens across the city, helping to manage trees and also providing that vital level of communication between residents and the tree professionals in the city and in the council. I think this, this is going to lead to some really positive working relationships going forward. Um, and it's given Woodland Trust absolute confidence in the way that the council are now willing to work with and engage local residents and communities. Um, so much so that this year we've awarded the council over £180,000 as part of our 2.9 million emergency tree fund to continue the great work that's been started as a result of the street tree strategy and as part of the wider fantastic um, uh, tree forestry work that's happening across the city. Um, and that funding will be used to continue to engage community groups um, and to, to engage them in the future management and care of the city's trees. So this is a really exciting um, position to move from that position of conflict through to working all parties working together to deliver some great projects for the city. Uh, and this is Abbeydale Street Trees. Abbeydale Street Trees is a grassroots campaign group that set up last year in Sheffield. They, they decided that they'd like to see uh, more street trees on Abbeydale Road, which currently doesn't have a single street tree. And they started campaigning and speaking to local residents and businesses to ask whether they would like to see more trees on Abbeydale Road. And they, they found that there was an overwhelming level of support from local businesses. Over 70% of businesses said that they would strongly like to, to support plans. And over 80% of local residents uh, said, yeah, we would really like to see trees on our streets. Uh, Abbeydale Street Trees are working now with the council through the Tree Vital Life Project to pilot community groups raising money uh, to plant street trees. And they've already done a, a walk around with Amy to look at where those potential street trees might go. And they've raised themselves £7,500 to put towards the planting of those trees. And that's been matched funded by Trees for Cities um, and should hopefully be seeing street trees going in in the next planting season. Um, Abdiel Street Trees went one step further and they've reached out to local businesses and private landowners along that stretch of road to ask if they might be happy for street trees to be planted. And in this photo here, Abdiel Street Trees are outside of a Tesco store. Uh, just just to the, at the right of the picture is a car park and on the, the far side of the road is a, a load of businesses. Um, this was a planting event earlier this year and uh, I was uh, fortunate to join them and had a fantastic day. What I was really overwhelmed by was the level of support from local residents who came over to say, you've already made my view better, how can I help? And I think on that one day, around two or three people uh, committed to volunteering to water those trees um, going forward. One of, the, one of the guys who lives in a flat opposite went into Tesco's and bought a bag of brioche. 
And uh, so many people stop by to say, thank you so much for what you're doing. So we know there's a lot of support in communities. And I think the fact that it was led by a community group enabled that kind of level of communication between residents uh, and the community where they felt comfortable coming and speaking and having those conversations. And um, we're really hoping to see this model uh, carried on and uh, developed elsewhere across the city of Sheffield. And this is Alice in Northampton. Uh, Alice Whitehead set up Save Our Trees Northampton in uh, 2016 to preserve, protect and plant trees in the town's highways. Um, Alice had uh, noticed that trees had been lost from her street and surrounding streets without replacement. And in fact, she went on to find that 58% of street trees have disappeared in Northampton over the last 50 years um, without replacement. And Alice decided she wanted to do something about this. So she started consulting with uh, her local councillors and MPs and held a range of events on her street to raise awareness amongst her local residents. She applied to Woodland Trust for one of our street tree celebration packs and got a nice set of bunting and whatnot to support her events. Um, and through her campaigning, um, she, she found that there was, there was support on her street to uh, plant more trees. And over the last four years, we've worked with Alice um, and Tree Consultancy Woodland Drilling Limited um, to navigate borough, count, borough and county council processes um, in order to, to secure the planting of 21 trees on Alice's street. It wasn't an easy process. It was uh, quite a com complicated uh, uh, number of a couple of years trying to get those trees in, but it's been hugely successful and has provided some great learning to take forward. Um, the Highways Authority have adopted those new trees as an asset and Alice has also created a network of local tree wardens who are now going to care for those new tree plantings. Uh, Alice has, has also set about changing policy in Northampton for the better and at the full council meeting in November last year, we went along with Alice who put forward a case for the council to develop a comprehensive tree strategy that will commit the council to more resources for trees in the town um, and councillors voted unanimously in favour of it. And we're now going to be working with Alice to ensure that that, that comes to fruition. Um, we're really hoping potentially that through the next round of Wooden Trust Emergency Tree Fund, we might be able to support that work in Northampton. Um, please do go onto the Urban Tree Festival's website and find out more about Alice's work there and about Alice's leaf motif. I can't wait to do that myself. Uh, but yeah, you can read more about what Alice is doing at the Urban Tree Festival and watch a really nice little short film that we've made about her as well. And this is Roger Parkinson. Many of you may be familiar with Roger. He, he, he came and did a talk last year. Um, Roger continues to work really hard to bring the council and communities together in Wakefield, as well as schools, businesses, com other community groups. Um, and this is a photo of Roger at Eccleswood High School planting a new hedgerow with year seven children. Um, Roger is something of a Wakefield tree celebrity um, and we've also made a film of Roger for the Urban Tree Festival. Roger's also doing a couple of talks. In Roger's 10 minute film, he talks really about how he's bringing the council and the community together to plant and protect trees across uh, the county. And I'd really encourage everyone to go and watch that. And we've been really delighted to see that Wakefield Council are absolutely fully supportive of Roger's efforts. And they've sent a lovely video to, uh, to share with um, the Urban Tree Festival. And I'm just gonna try and play that for you now. Like many people in Wakefield, I grew up around the fantastic parks and open spaces that we have. But like many people, I took these for granted. The coronavirus lockdown changed all that. Now I have a greater appreciation for the value of our green spaces, the freedom they give us from everyday life, a more leisurely pace, exercising, enjoying sports activity, and they help us connect with nature. That's why Wakefield Council are investing £1.5 million into our parks and green spaces. We're recruiting 12 new park rangers and we're planting more trees and wildflower verges around the district. We want to create a home for nature in Wakefield. There is a huge financial benefit to the nation and the economy. 
the reality is our parks and public open spaces are priceless. We are planting shrubs, bushes, borders, flowering meadows, and we're planting tens of thousands of native trees. We're on course to creating the right environment to welcome and support bees and other pollinating insects, to create habitats for biodiversity, and to be carbon sinks, to store carbon and filter and clean our atmosphere. We're focused on creating spaces that are central to the health and well-being of communities and nature, particularly as we work with friends groups, tree wardens, and volunteers to improve our parks and spaces. For those of you at the Urban Tree Festival, you're in for a treat. Roger Parkinson, one of our most tireless and energetic tree wardens, will be taking you on a fantastic virtual tour of the district and showing you what can be achieved when the council and community work together. I hope you enjoy the tour. I hope you enjoyed that and we were absolutely delighted to receive that from Wakefield Council and to see that level of level of acknowledgement of just how important tree wardens and community groups are um, in delivering action for woods and trees um, in local areas so definitely do go and watch Roger's 10 minute film and some of his webinars where he'll be talking in a lot more depth about how he's doing that um, Roger and uh, Alice and Abidal Street Trees are all charter branches with the Woodland Trust. I won't go into too much detail on the tree charter because I know uh, Zara and my colleague, our tree charter lead, talked, talked here last year about that. Um, but the tree charter is a movement that's all about connecting people and trees and empowering communities to stand up for trees. Uh, it has 12 principles um, and you can read more about that on the tree charter website. But it's really about empowering community groups and uh, overcoming the disconnect that we have with our woods and trees. And in fact, that's a continuing problem. Although we're seeing so much positive action for woods and trees and communities, we know that there's still a lot of work to do um, more widely. The Wooden Trust commissioned research in 2017, which showed that there is actually a growing disconnect with trees in urban areas um, and involving, involvement in taking action for them is even amongst those who are concerned quite low. Um, and we, we, see, we see issues such as vandalism, even where the community has been involved. So this is a, a tree that was planted in Swansea with Swansea Tree Forum. Um, and sadly, it was vandalised, it was snapped in half, as were a couple of other trees that were planted um, on the same day. So we know that there are still a lot of barriers to overcome, but it's really only by working together, bringing tree professionals and community groups together that we can really begin to, to do that. I thought I might just go over what we've learned through our work with communities in urban areas over the past few years. And that really is that community engagement is absolutely essential. Bringing professionals, councillors and community groups together really to look at that vision collectively and to support each other to bring it to life. Um, compassion, communication and true consultation leads to understanding on all sides. Um, and there really needs to be transparency so that there is a collective willingness to work together. Communities have a real passion and energy that's there to be harnessed. Um, uh, we often feel if communities are passionate enough to contact Woodland Trust about issues that are concerning them, the likelihood is that the passion and willingness is there to engage with people in their local communities and professionals to do more for woods and trees. What can Woodland Trust do? Well, we continue to support, inform and mobilise local communities to understand the benefits of the urban forest and to take actions for them. And we don't only do that alone through events like our Tree Charter Festival and Big Climate Fight Back. We're also delighted to work with partners and to sponsor events like the Urban Tree Festival, which is doing a fantastic job of reaching people and, and getting that engagement going around urban trees. We provide tools, information and resources. Um, we can provide access to trees and funding, like through our emergency tree fund. We're really here to amplify the voice of everyone working for the benefit of trees through our work with councillors, council leaders, officers, and uh, through our wider lobbying work with national government. And we know that partnerships are key. 
we're not the only uh, tree charity out there who are working for the benefit of trees. Um, there's a lot of organisations out there also doing the best that they can and cross-sector collaboration is absolutely key to creating a better future. That's, that's me. Thank you very much, Sarah. Great stuff. And of course, if anyone's out there wondering what other kind of hardworking charities there are that look after trees, we're a charity too, of course. We're a charity. We're just a little one, but we're a charity. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. Really good stuff. We've got great questions coming in, lots of chat going on, all good stuff. Uh, if you have any more questions, please send them in. And, and if you're aiming them at a, at a particular person, then please do say who you're aiming those questions at. And now any moment, as if by magic, we're going to see the lovely smiling face of Russell. There he is. I wasn't worried at all, Russell. It's all fine. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to hand over to our third and final guest, Russell. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, really great to be here. Let me just see if I can share my screen, which hopefully I can. And hopefully you can now see a presentation. Um, so, yes. Tree Musketeers and Community Arboriculture. Um, I'm going to talk to you this evening about 20 years of uh, a community group called Tree Musketeers and what we've invented. Um, I, I like to call community arboriculture. I'm a professional arboricultural consultant like Greg. Uh, Greg works as a tree officer. I, I work independently. Um, and what I, we've been doing with Tree Musketeers for the best part of 20 years is doing exactly what Greg was talking about, building bridges, um, making links between tree professionals and the local community, including politicians, and uh, really bringing tree wisdom to people and people to trees and sharing understanding, sharing wisdom and uh, doing a lot of stuff at the same time. So really what I'm gonna be talking about is what you can do, what you can achieve if you mix all those things together, if you mix public enthusiasm with a bit of professional expertise, um, plus hopefully a bit of political support and some funding. Um, so it all starts with seed. So uh, we collect seed from local trees. Uh, this is a, a fruiting uh, street tree, uh, quite an unusual one called an Amura cork tree. Um, we collect seeds from such trees and we use that seed to grow at our community tree nursery. Now I'm going to try and show a video now um, of us collecting some other seed. I'm not sure this is going to work, but with a bit of luck it might. Collecting pine seeds from the Bhutan pine at Springfield Park. Ta -da. So that was just a little um, a little snippet of uh, collecting some pine seeds from one of the trees in the park. So we collect them from street trees, we collect them from parks, and they are then used to grow on trees at our community tree nursery. The significance about collecting tree seed is that if you grow trees from seed, uh, particularly local seed, they're more likely to be suited to local conditions. Um, there's an ice cream van going around at the moment, so I hope you can't hear that. But um, if you can, I can't get you an ice cream. Um, so but the other advantage of growing trees from seed is that they've got greater genetic diversity um, and therefore greater disease resistance than cloned trees. Quite a lot of trees that you might find on streets are specifically created street tree clones. Um, and although they have their place because the reason why they, those clones are used is usually because they're particularly suited to the challenging environments of a street tree. Um, if you're going to grow stuff in parks, you probably want to be avoiding clones where possible and getting greater genetic diversity. So this is Hackney Community Tree Nursery. It holds around a thousand trees at any one time, approximately of which a hundred are planted out each year into Hackney parks. And there we tend to specialise in unusual trees like native black poplar, conifers, rare sorbus, and fruit trees. Reason being, you can secure um, native, uh, the broad range of native trees reasonably easily from other nurseries or indeed the Woodland Trust. Um, and as a small nursery, 
we might as well specialize in stuff that is a bit harder to get hold of. So um, over the 20 years that we've been going, the site has developed. Um, it's quite tricky running a tree nursery entirely with volunteers, a lot of technical stuff. You've got to be very careful about disease. Um, we did have a, a phytophthora issue at times. And so it, it's quite complicated, um, quite important the way you do your biosecurity. But one of the advantages of having a local tree nursery is you aren't introducing disease from elsewhere. And that's been a big problem um, and is an increasing problem globally. So seed propagation, that's a little uh, maritime pine seed growing at the nursery. And you can see the seed head just popping off as the uh, pine seedlings growing out of the soil. Not something you will see uh, very often unless you're involved in propagation. And these are some unusual trees coming up. The Amur cork tree, again, um, Philodendron, we've managed to get that to germinate. And also True Service, which is one of the rarest uh, native trees, although there's some debate as to whether or not it's really native. That's the nature of um, debates about trees. There's usually three opinions on every subject, at least. Um, but we propagate uh, a lot of trees at the tree nursery, and um, it's a really, really good way to produce the, the specific trees that you want um, and we will be sharing those uh, with other groups as well. Uh, in addition to seed propagation, you've got vegetative propagation. So this is a, a whip and tongue graft on an apple tree. Um, we do quite a lot of uh, community stuff with orchards. So we grow our own fruit trees, we propagate our own fruit trees, and we work with groups like the Orchard Project on occasions to graft rare or endangered uh, varieties uh, in order to um, secure their survival as well. And then cutting is another form of vegetative propagation. Uh, I was doing a, a project with, I think it's UCL, uh, University College London, uh, where they're propagating the Torrington Square um, black mulberry. Uh, black mulberry is a little bit tricky to propagate by cutting, but fingers crossed, looks like these ones uh, have taken. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll have lots of uh, black mulberries to share. So a little bit about sustainable tree planting. This is one of my big um, things at the moment. Um, and really what Tree Musketeers has been all about all along, because we set up Tree Musketeers because a lot of trees that get planted don't survive. And no doubt many of you will know of this problem. So what we've done is actually develop our own strategies very specifically for particularly planting in London and the Southeast of England. So what is sustainable tree planting? Well, to my mind, it involves three things. It involves planting small trees with big roots, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. It means adapting your planting techniques to local conditions. And uh, I think there's an awful lot more work that could be done in terms of teaching tree planting techniques. I don't think it's prioritized nearly enough in colleges um, or generally um, people tend to think, you know, providing you get the tree in the right way up in the ground, it's gonna grow. Um, and whilst that might work, um, it's better to give them a, a, a really good start if you can. And then aftercare, water, weed, mulch, water, weed, mulch, repeat. Um, and I shall go through each of these items because they're quite important. So just a little bit about small trees with big roots. This is a seedling. So um, it has what you might call a one-to-one -one root to crown ratio. In other words, it's got a few leaves, it's got a few roots, and they're roughly um, equilibrium. I'm amazed. I don't think this is taught in colleges. I'd be really interested if anyone who's studying arboriculture um, has actually been taught this. I'd love to have that feedback because I'm not sure it is taught. So here you've got a commercially grown uh, heavy standard. Um, because commercial nurseries are commercial, they have to make money. Um, they necessarily reduce safe space and save compost um, by growing big trees in small containers. And so you end up with a root to crown ratio of approximately one to five or more than that. And that means these trees are gonna take a long time to establish an equilibrium. And during that time, they're gonna be more vulnerable to drought stress. And because of that, they're gonna be more vulnerable to disease. Whereas at Tree Musketeers, because we've got our own tree nursery and it's run by volunteers, we grow light standards, in other words, slightly smaller trees in large pots, which gives you a much better root to crown ratio. And we have a root to crown ratio of the stuff we plant of about one to two. That means you've got reduced planting, reduced need for post-plant watering, uh, watering once you've planted, you don't have to use so much water, you accelerate the uh, establishment and reduce risks from drought stress. So a lot of what I'm talking about is about drought stress because 
we are a Hackney-based group. London is a very, very dry city. But I would say this applies to anywhere in the southeast of England um, and potentially elsewhere as well. So there you have uh, a tree on the right. This was in our early days when we were buying uh, or, or the local authority were providing heavy standards for us to plant. And that's when we were planting with uh, the Asian youth movement. Um, and on the left, uh, there's a tree that we rescued actually from the Olympic site um, when uh, the 2012 Olympics was being uh, developed. And we grew that into a light standard. And you can see the difference. The light standard has got a roughly one to two ratio and the heavy standard more like a one to five. And this is why all this matters. Now, I'm not gonna say who planted these trees, but that is mm, something like 3000 dead trees. Um, they died within months of being planted. The reason why that happened is because it was not planned for drought. The uh, planting that was done was not mulched at the time. It was mulched afterwards, but the trees were pretty much dead by the time that happened. So my point here is droughts happen in Southeast England. They're not a surprise. You have to plan for drought and you have to adapt your planting techniques um, for those local conditions. And that's what we've been doing for tree musketeers for about 20 years now. So planting techniques for a thirsty planet. Plant small trees with big root systems. You all got that now because I've just explained root to crown ratios. Second part of planting techniques for a thirsty planet is dig a hole that fits the tree. And I'll explain that in a moment and then remove the grass. I'll explain that too. So dig a hole that fits the tree. Surely that's obvious. Well, not exactly. If you're taught how to plant a bare rooted tree, you have generally been taught that you need to prune the roots to make sure that they don't end up going round in circles in, in, the, in the tree pit when you dig your pit. Now that's true. You don't want roots going round in circles. And if you dig a hole that's not big enough, you do want to cut the roots to make sure they're not going round in circles. But why not just dig a, dig a big hole? It may not be practical if you're contract planting and you're on a, a piece rate, but volunteers love to take time and look after their trees. So this is what we teach. Um, you know, if you've got a long root that isn't going to go in a square hole, we'll dig a trench for it. Um, the, 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 it gives you more root, it makes it more sustainable, and your tree is less likely to struggle for lack of water, um, and it's going to have a much better root to crown ratio from day one. So uh, there's one of our lovely volunteers, um, Sharon, digging uh, trenches for her Sakura cherry tree roots. And then create a nice big weed free zone around the tree. So you've planted your tree, it's in its own space, but in addition, weed the area around the tree. There's no roots in that area at the moment, but if you remove the grass competition from this area, what you'll do is create an ideal rooting zone for the tree to root into. Add mulch to that root-free zone, and you've got an optimal root development area for lateral root development. So these are all the techniques that I've developed with Tree Musketeers, applying a paracultural knowledge to the problem of planting in London, problem of planting in drought areas, and it massively increases the ability um, for trees to survive drought. And it's all about this combination between expertise and dedication that you get with volunteers. And not to forget watering. Obviously, watering is crucial if you're planting anything other than whips. If you plant whips, small trees, um, there's a different system. You're basically dealing with competition as your primary mechanism for making sure the tree survives. But if you're planting larger trees, you've got to go back and water them because they're going to have a poor root to crown ratio and you've got to help them establish. And the key to understanding tree watering is start early. Spring of the first season is the crucial time. You've got to get the tree adapted and growing well in its first season. Don't wait, don't try and play catch up because once the tree is stressed, it's gonna be much harder to bring it back. Um, we developed this system where we use hand pulled trolleys with 32 five liter mineral water bottles. Um, anyone good at mass can work out that that's uh, 160 liters of water, which is 160 kilograms. Uh, so this isn't so good for hilly sites, um, but it's a very, very effective system of recycling plastics, getting water to trees, and really involving everyone because you can just walk this thing along and uh, everyone likes to join in, particularly kids. So water, as soon as bud burst or very soon after bud burst, 
Uh, Three Musketeers trees this year are on their fourth watering cycle this weekend. So it's only the middle of May, but it's been very, very dry. And so the trees are going to get watered for their fourth time uh, at the weekend. Water is very heavy and it costs carbon to produce water. So you want to minimize the water demand of the trees you're planting, which is another reason for planting the small trees in the first place. You don't need so much water. Thanks to a, grant, a very generous grant from Hackney Council, we now have Goopy, a little electric vehicle uh, made in France. Uh, it, it's kind of a cross between a Tonka toy and a proper truck. It's actually tiny. It's only one meter, 1.1 meter wide, uh, but it's wide enough to get a 500 liter mineral, um, 500 liter water tank on the back um, and an electric pump. And there we have a volunteer watering a tree um, just by the roadside. So what the vehicle does is it gives us an extra capacity now where we've got uh, a difficult site, which is difficult to get water to, or where volunteers are away, or for whatever reason you need someone to step in, um, the vehicle can go and, and, and do the watering. So massive, massive advantage. So that's planting techniques for a thirsty planet. Now a little bit about planting techniques for quality and quantity. What I've been talking about is planting quality. What if you really want to get a lot of trees in the ground? There's an awful lot of emphasis on numbers, and I'm very much an advocate of not worrying about numbers, but worrying about quality. But if you do want to get a lot of trees in quickly, Hackney um, had an offer of 100 plus Sakura cherries from the Japanese UK Friendly Society. And they've been held over at the Frank Matthews Tree Nursery. So they had to go in this year, but we had lockdown. So somehow we had to get 101 bare rooted light standard Sakura cherry trees in the ground quickly um, because it came after our uh, existing 100 trees that we were already planting as our existing planting program. So we managed to get 101 bare rooted trees in, in eight days during lockdown. How did we do that? Well, we didn't compromise on quality. What it's all about is planning. You train teams, small teams of keen, competent people. As you build up your volunteers, you recognize the people who are capable of taking on responsibility, take, capable of learning, who you can trust to do things. You encourage them to, to, to have their own small teams. You plan, you prepare, you organize the logistics, um, loads of teamwork and supervision. So you've got all the pieces in place before you actually get on site. If you get all that right and your people are well trained and you do good supervision, you can retain quality whilst planting quantity. Um, so I haven't got time to go into all the things that the Tree Musketeers do, but just finally some of the other stuff that we do, there's woodland management. We help manage a 10 hectare woodland, uh, uh, secondary woodland planted only 20 years ago. And this is a shot of one of the coppiced areas that uh, we regularly coppice in the woodland and we primarily use the product to create dead hedges within the wood because new secondary woodland always lacks um, age structure, it lacks dead wood and dead wood is a key component of a healthy woodland. It's where most of the wildlife lives so these big dead hedges that we build are where the um, wood mice, um, where the fungi, where the beetles where all the other really important wildlife are going to be hanging out. Hopefully there's hedgehogs there as well. One of the few places where hedgehogs are clinging on in London. So that's the woodland management side. Obviously we haven't been able to do that with COVID. Um, we did keep the planting going, but we haven't done the woodland management this year. Uh, tree walks. So I lead quite a lot of tree walks. This is uh, me looking at uh, a quite a unusual Western Catalpa in Abney Park Cemetery. Obviously, tree walks have been off the agenda for the past year. Hopefully, we will be getting back into those uh, come June. But we regularly lead tree walks of 50 or 100 people around Hackney, looking at either the parks or the street trees um, or elsewhere. And then managing the community orchards. So uh, we've got a dozen community orchards in Hackney, and each of those needs pruning. We didn't do the public engagement pruning that we normally do this year. We just had a few uh, keen volunteers go out who knew what they were doing so that the orchards did get pruned, but without the risk of COVID. Uh, so that's another aspect 
to what Three Musketeers have done. So all of these things that I've been talking about, they're all achievable community engagement opportunities where with a little bit of arboricultural expertise, you can take things an extra, an extra, uh, an extra part of the journey. Um, we've got fantastic orchards. We don't tend to see a lot of the fruit because it does tend to disappear very quickly. I'm not sure if it's because people make cider or because some people like to eat it when it's a bit on the sour side, but it's nevertheless a fantastic biodiversity asset. So that's it. That's Tree Musketeers Community Arboriculture. Um, follow us on Twitter or Instagram. I hope that was useful and I hope you will get involved in your community group where you are. And if you are an art professional and you've got a bit of time on your hands, why not help out your local community group? Because I'm sure they will value your expertise. Um, thanks everyone for listening and I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions. That was brilliant, Russell. Thank you so much. Inspirational stuff. Um, it's always, I've worked in London for many years and Hackney was always held up as being just a great example of how stuff could be done, not only because of your work, but also a special mention to Rupert Bentley Walls as well for everything he's done. Um, so well done. Okay, good stuff. What have we got? I'll just say, if you've got questions, I've seen some questions zipping up through the chat. I'm not going to be able to ask questions from the chat. Uh, I'm not great at asking them from the Q&A panel, and that's really simple for me. So if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A panel, please. Um, okay, we've got so oh, there's some big issues raised. Let's ask a nice kind of generally one, um, and I'll go to you first, Greg, then Sarah, then Russell. We'll keep that order. Um, and it's a question from Jack, who's asking that given that some residents are resistant to street trees, do you have any success stories regarding turn people around towards trees, or I suppose convincing them that actually a tree is a good thing to have outside their, their house? So um, I'm sure you've all got certain examples of thoughts, but Greg, I'll put you on the spot first. Um, one thing I'll start with, and I'll kind of start with it because I know how much you, you're not a fan of it at times, John, is um planting up tree pits where it's appropriate to do so because it's a great addition to the street scene it's uh can be great for wildlife as well um plus also it, it gets people invested in the trees on their street and up in islington in north london where i am we have a couple of competitive streets who want to have the best planted tree pits um yeah, grass of course you don't want it to be happening on newly established trees or digging too far in and damaging the roots but kind of, yeah, it's something I really like. It really brightens up the dull greyness of the concrete by having these passed out tree pits. Um, and it, yeah, it gets people invested. Um, I think there's only so much you can do in talking about why street trees are good. Because if you talk about, you know, ecosystem services and carbon absorbance when someone desperately wants better TV signal or more shade in, the, in their front room, you're not going to convince them. Um, yeah, I think getting people involved in planting, especially children in schools, gets them invested in the tree. You always have people who want the driveway, who want the extension, who want the reception. But engaging people in the actual planting and sometimes selection of the trees, I think is a great is, is a great way to go about. Thanks, Greg. I should say I'm not universally against planting in tree pits. What I saw a lot of in London was when you plant a new tree, you, a street tree, you put your mulch around it, it would be all set. And then well-meaning residents would take away all the mulch, get their spades in there, really start digging up that tree pit, sometimes into the root ball, and then planting, climbing plants in there because it looked pretty. And that's just not always necessarily the best thing for the tree, is the only thing I'd say. So liaising with a local tree officer is always a good idea um okay thank you greg sarah any thoughts on that question i, I guess i'd follow on from greg and, and echo similar I, i'm struggling to think of an exact example we've been involved in often we're in, engaged with communities who really want those trees planted but just as an example alice in northampton um had to do a lot of engagement on her own street to go and talk to residents and say you know how do you feel about this what trees might you want to see planted and it, Echoing Greg, it's having that conversation around what species would you want to see and trying to get that support going. And, you know, we we definitely see those people who, who don't like trees. And that's, that's, I guess, where the tree charter movement and trying to engage more people in the benefits of urban woods and trees comes in. Um, but I think it takes those constant um, 
constant communication and talking to residents about the benefits of those trees and maybe giving more, more powers to tree officers to, to uh, make those decisions and have those conversations. And obviously we saw in, in the talk um, I did that some of the trees in Swansea were vandalised. So it's not, it's not an easy win all the time, but constant engagement and communication. And as Greg mentioned, I think starting with young people in schools, some of the work Roger's done in Wakefield is a great example. Thanks, Sarah. Russell, you must have had plenty of experience of people not wanting that tree planted outside their house. Yeah, not only not wanting it outside the house, you get them, you know, saying, oh, you can't plant it in the park outside my house either. So, you know, you, you do get it. Um, I mean, I think there's multiple answers, aren't there? I mean, you know, there, there, there's the obvious ones, climate change, you know, do you want your kids, you know, to live in a, a world that's not, you know, five degrees hotter than it is now. Um, but obviously some people who are hostile to trees aren't necessarily sensitive to those sort of ecological arguments. So another one is, well, it's gonna make your house worth more um, because you know properties with street, tree, street trees uh, in, the, in, in the streets are usually more valuable. Um, and that can tend to work with the kind of, you know, people who are thinking from a slightly different perspective. Um, another one is reduced air pollution. Um, you know, the, 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 the street trees play an important role in, in reducing air pollution. Um, but I do echo uh, very much what Sarah said in terms of engagement. Um, the more engagement you can do, the better. And uh, the big thing I would really champion um, for everyone is more power to tree officers. Um, tree officers, like all local authority um, services, have been cut very, very severely. And if tree officers had greater budgets and more time, they would do more engagement and that would greatly improve relations and the way in which trees are maintained. Um, but yeah, there, 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 there are arguments. I think one of the things about tree musketeers having been around 20 years, once you get known, you have a little bit more credibility and the vandalism issues tend to be um, where something's happened and, and the engagement hasn't been as effective. I mean, that said, engage, vandalism can happen anywhere, but it, sometimes vandalism is a way of disenfranchised people asserting ownership. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll shut up. Thanks, Russell. Um, I'm hoping we're going to have a nice long talk about tree officers in a bit, but um, on the other point you mentioned, the... Uh, using different benefits for different people. I think that's a really important thing about, you know, the trees are multifunctional infrastructure. And it's pretty easy, I find, if you sort of find out what people care about, as, as I don't know if Rob Northrop's watching tonight, but the social values he, he always refers to, find out what they care about, and trees will probably be able to be sort of sold to them as part of the solution to that thing. So they're, they're quite an easy sell in many ways. Okay, we've got some very specific questions and some very kind of uh, general questions. I'm going to go with a specific one. We'll throw a specific one at Sarah. Question from Jane. Sarah, does the Woodland Trust give grants and provide support to urban tree and woodland projects in Scotland? Uh, well, we, we provide a range of, of support to different projects. So I'd love to find out more about what specifically that project is. And um, we work across Scotland with community groups. If it's a community group, um, our charter programme has grant funding available for communities. And we work with local authorities as well, including in Scotland. So I'd love to know more about that project and I can find out more information. Thanks, Sarah. And Tree Chart has been mentioned a couple of times, but it's well worth a look up more information for everyone out there about the Tree Charter. And we did have a, a one of our Wednesday webinars was all about the Tree Charter. So it's but the link. Sophie's pretty good. I'm going to put this chat in. Sophie, see if you can put the link to that webinar in the chat. Sophie's very good. I'm sure it'll appear in the chat soon. Um, OK, let's go to a quite a broad question. We'll go around the same sort of Greg, Sarah, Russell one again. And it's a question from Anthony about how can all trees be protected before any design process, regardless of the actual physical excavations and construction, how can we protect all trees? And I think this originated a little bit with um, some of Sarah's comments around Sheffield and this idea that comes back now and then about should all trees automatically be protected, you know, trees over a certain DBH or whatever it is, and is that a way of protecting all trees in the face of development, um, or are there any drawbacks, or is that good or a bad idea? Greg, I'll ask you first. You're a tree officer. What do you think about that automatic protection for trees? Um, I do like the idea of that. I mean, obviously, there's going to be challenges. Um, 
Sorry, my neighbour's kids are trying to kill each other in the neighbour's garden. If you can hear shrieking in the background, um, it's quite quite upsetting. Thinking up a very difficult answer to a really complex question. Um, yeah, I mean, I really like the idea of that, and I've spoken to people in the past that I I'm not a big fan of tree preservation orders. I don't think they're fit for purpose anymore. I think we need a, to get rid of them and do a better system. And part of that is increasing the statutory protection of all trees. But it's that of all trees bit because everyone, everyone who works with trees knows that tree removal is part of general tree management, be it you know thinning to allow new species to come through or where developments have to happen. Um, I think, sadly, there's always going to be a bias towards protecting planted trees over natural regeneration. And I think that that could be a way to go. I don't know exactly. But, um, yeah, I... I think that I think it, it definitely should be recognised in legislation that all trees, in whatever capacity, have stronger have stronger protection and recognition, um, especially when it comes to developments. Because you know, the Happy Man case was the best and the worst example of how a developer went. No, oh, we didn't think it was that that liked, and they they could have saved it, but they didn't. Um, I th yeah, I think also yeah, picking up the tree officers, my own kind. Um, in the councils, we kind of found the pecking order from highways and from housing. And while they're really, really important infrastructure parts of local authorities, quite often trees will come secondary to road redevelopment or housing projects and giving local authority tree officers more say in terms of decision making and earlier on. And I think perhaps that will, as a starting point, making sure that all local authorities across the country have in post tree offices and properly funded tree offices. And I think that before anything else could be the real first line to improve things. But yeah, you know, it's maybe a bit idealistic on my part, but that's kind of the best answer I can give because it's it's a, a monumentally complex question. Thank you, Greg. Sarah, have you got any ideas about that one? I think uh, I'd love to hear the question again, um, but just following on from Greg, I think we know we'd love to see trees fully protected and for, for them to kind of protection to come first and then to consider whether felling needs to happen next. And that really does come down to the fuller, the, you know, the full proper engagement of all the relevant parties, whether that's residents, local authority tree officers, right at the very start of any process so that those professionals can give their input right at the beginning and make sure every voice comes to the table. But at the moment, I think we see a lot of silo working um, rather than the right people being brought in at the right time. And we all need trees. So, uh, you know, we, we need to look at trees, uh, kind of like a tree first approach, making sure that they're taken into consideration at the, the very beginning of any decision making process. Thank you, Sarah. Russell. Yeah, OK, so I think the first thing is to protect the most valuable trees. And I would support the project, which I think the Woodland Trust has led on, but certainly Jill Butler and Ancient Tree Forum have, have kind of tried to push, which is trees of national importance. There, there needs to be a designation for particularly important trees because Britain has some of the most important trees in the world um, and has quite a lot of them, particularly in the ancient trees in the form of um, thousands upon thousands of ancient oaks. Um, and other ancient trees. So th that's the first thing, protect the best that you've got. And they are currently not protected nearly enough. The second problem is the presumption to, in favor of development within the planning system. Um, the, the, the planning system is biased towards development. And that's where the trees tend to come up against a really hard edge. Um, Hackney is in many respects, a really good borough for trees. Um, John's absolutely right. Rupert's done fantastic work in creating what is effectively a Hackney Arboretum. He's planted an amazing diversity of street trees and Hackney is really, really good on trees. Yet the Happy Man tree, which was a 150 year old street tree, got felled in Hackney. Um, now, wow, how did that happen? And the reason it happened is because the planning system's not fit for purpose. And um, the, 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 the planning system goes through various phases, outline planning permission, and then full planning permission. And on the development like the Woodbury Down development, it went through those various phases. <clears throat> and, you know, frankly, I'm a little bit skeptical about Barclay Homes saying, oh, 
we didn't realize it was that important because it was graded A1 on the original survey. So, you know, someone should have said that's an A1 tree, you should be keeping it. Um, but the solutions to these are giving tree officers and tree people a stronger voice, voice within the planning system, um, removing the presumption in favor of development. I mean, this is a gradual process. Um, I saw, I think one of the colleagues from the Netherlands who's with us has hinted at it. It's, it's part of the general process of, um, you know, neoliberalism where you push money rather than the natural world. Um, but the, the, the a generic protection for all trees, I'm not sure that would help because I think what that would do is create conflict and, and issues around potentially the less important issues. Um, so certainly if I was going to prioritise, I would say trees of national importance first, balance the planning system ecologically in general, not just in relation to trees, and socially, for Christ's sake, you know, I mean, an awful lot of development doesn't do people much good, you know, so effectively what we do is build massive debt prisons for people, um, and half of those buildings are left empty in uh, uh, investment units. So, sorry, I'm ranting, I'm talking politics, I'll shut up. Quite right too, Russell, I couldn't possibly comment, obviously, but hurrah. Um, just, to, just to come back in on that, I think, you know, and, and we're seeing changes to the national planning policy framework that are absolutely terrifying for woods and trees and for local democracy and the voice of people who are trying to attempt to stand up for their woods and trees. And, you know, we, we saw a, a, a shift towards in the national planning policy framework to protect ancient woods and trees um, in, you know, that they would be held in wholly exceptional circumstances a couple of years ago, which is um, amazing. But I think we really do need to see as you say, Russell, you know, ancient woods and trees, those that are irreplaceable, um, absolutely protected. Um, but with the recognition that there are trees like the Happy Man tree in London that might not be uh, classed as ancient or veteran and, and therefore protected in that way, but to a local community, that's a fundamental uh, connection to the past. And there needs to be a, a way to recognize those trees in the planning system. And that definitely needs to be at the very beginning of the process. Yeah, there, there, there's a good example. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any uh, Polish friends and colleagues on, but the uh, the Green Monument uh, program in Poland, which sort of recognises particularly important trees, is, is a good one to look at. Um, one of the problems often raised with putting blanket, um, uh, I'm sort of jumping around a bit here, but blanket protections on trees based on DBH is that you'd have to introduce legislation to do it and then that would give people almost fair warning that a lot of people might end up proactively removing trees that they think could then be protected in the future. And you could end up losing loads and loads of trees that actually you wouldn't have lost if you hadn't have tried to put in that legislation. I'm not sure if uh, if that sounds accurate, Russell. I don't know if you've got anything on that. You're sort of leaning in or you're just thinking. No, that's fine. That's good. I didn't know. I thought you were going to unmute yourself. It's such a confusing world these days. Um, OK, good stuff. Right. Where was I going to go next? Uh, oh, let's talk about let's talk about tree officers. Tree officers are brilliant. They've been mentioned quite a few times, and and a lot of the questions, a lot of the comments, I think, actually find their origins in tree officers and the fact that tree officers has been criminally underfunded for so long. And a lot of the community engagement work, a lot of the consultation and and the going out there, the management people are talking about checking up on developers and all this for pretty standard 537. A lot of that work should be being done by tree officers and they're not, not doing it because they don't want to do it. They're not doing it because they simply don't have the time or the resources to do it. And um, they're under huge amounts of pressure and you should all uh, think about and care about your tree officer. I might even post a link to an article I wrote about tree officers a little rant to save you all here. But there's an interesting point about tree officers been brought up um, by Epi in Israel. Uh, who said, here in Israel, our tree officers and municipal servants loyal to the municipality with a built-in conflict of interest because the municipality prioritises development. And again, I've certainly found that difficult in my time as a tree manager. I mean, Greg, I'll come to you. Obviously, don't give me any examples of immediately because you're a tree officer now, but how much of a conflict do you think there is for tree officers in balancing protecting trees, like obviously they want to do as custodians of our urban trees, but with the demands for development and for highway engineering and everything. Well, um, for myself and the department I work in, we seem, we, in the way we approach our job, we have a good degree of um, independence in the sense that we, ha we have our tree policy that we work to, and then we, we, we comment on various applications. 
um, and we we sort of do that impartially uh, without prejudice. But it's who listens to it afterwards, and more often than not. I say we are not in the planning side, but my colleagues in planning will make their recommendation on a particular development or application. And you know, quite often, for more private resident, residential developments, smaller scale, they'll get listened to. But for the larger ones, the um, planning directorate won't always take the advice that we're that we're offering. And then it will inevitably come down in favour of the um, of, of the development, and then. So that's one of the reasons I think you know, tree officers should have a greater recognition and say in local authorities. But also, it creates a lot of problems for us because as for tree officers, we're the, almost the public face of the tree department. And then even though we advocated for attention, we're not listened to. And then uh, various members of the team will get some really, really horrific and nasty emails from some very, very understandably angry people saying we're incompetent, we're useless, we're corrupt, and aiming it at the wrong people. Not that I'm accusing anyone in the council of being corrupt at all, but we've advocated for attention, not always listened to, and then the anger's directed towards us, and it's because we don't have, always have the time or the resources to properly communicate with, with the public. And then my manager, who I won't name, how, how he's not given up in the past couple of years, given some of the um, really un unpleasant emails that he gets, definitely admire his, his fortitude and I think that's one of the reasons why a increasing true officer role and power and protection but also really engaging with communities so they can actually understand what the process is and what we've been doing to try and protect it. Thank you Greg. I won't name him either but he hasn't given up because he's brilliant and he's going to keep going. Um, I mean Sarah I don't know to what extent you sort of have crossovers with the tree officers and work with tree officers in, in your in your work but I don't know if you've got any thoughts or or anything you'd like to say on the tree officer subject? No, I think I'm I'm really fortunate in that I've I've built a good uh, working relationship with Greg. And if there's any issues, I think I'll be great to run that past Greg. I will pick up the phone. And I think it all comes down to uh, working together and knowing where your level of um, insight and expertise starts and ends, and who to call for advice and information. But um, I think in that case, I think we we see. In, I definitely see in my role, tree officers. Uh, they, as Greg has said, is that you know they're facing the public, and the public perhaps don't understand the decisions that being made, are being made. And I think the more we can do to break down those barriers and uh, get that engagement going, and I think you know groups like Roger, Rogers Wakefield Tree Wardens, he is essentially that that communication piece between his his local council department, tree department, and the local community. And you know Roger's given me examples of. A member of the community calling him up saying Roger this tree's being vandalized and giving him a bit of stick and he's been able to kind of then go to the council more constructively and Roger definitely sees his, that as his role as a tree warden and I think how can uh, people support tree officers who are overstretched and underfunded and under a lot of pressure how, how can how can the community how can tree wardens groups support you in your roles um, to do more and how can we as a as a charity as an organization support um those community groups as well and kind of bring it all all together seamlessly i think you know our work with roger providing trees providing advice and support and and roger then working closely with his council has worked really well in wakefield and it's what learning we can take from that um elsewhere really and you know we see there's a there's a a, a case i was um contacted about recently from a member of the public who stands to lose about a 200 or 300 year old oak tree as a result of a subsidence case and having spoken to the tree officer at the council I know that that tree officer does not want that tree to go uh, has written a report saying that the tree is not the cause of the subsidence but is facing uh, difficulty with other council departments who are dealing with the legalities and the risk of retaining that tree and so it, it's it's again navigating how can we support could the community start a campaign that that raises the profile of that tree and get support in a you know in a kind of roundabout way um yeah that's just a few thoughts from me thanks sarah russell i mean same question any thoughts on tree officers but also i think you know in your own example how important has that relationship with rupert been over the years yeah i mean i, I actually got involved as a tree warden originally um under um ian graham 
the Rupert's predecessor. It was it was Ian Graham, the kind of tree officer who inspired me and got me interested in trees. I was a lawyer before, you know. Um, I, he got me out of an office. It's brilliant. Um, uh, and you know, uh, tree officers play an amazingly important role. And I think I, I am going to come back to politics because all of this does come down to politics in the sense that councils are very big things. There are lots of different people in councils, and there are lots of different agendas. And people tend to sort of assume that something happens, it's the council's fault. And actually, there's going to be a lot of conflicting interests within the council. And those who care about trees, just like local authority ecologists, local authority biodiversity officers, and, and conservation officers, loads of local authority officers, they're not in that job because they don't care. It didn't pay that well. They get a lot of grief. So, you know, they're in there because they're public servants and they believe in what they're doing. And the fundamental problem is public service has been cut to shreds in this country. And meanwhile, a whole bunch of people have made shed loads of money destroying stuff. Um, and that is essentially what development is about, because most development doesn't serve communities either. So um, really, ultimately, all this needs a political solution. And I know that's, this isn't the forum for that, but it's important to bear in mind. Coming back more precisely to where we are now, I completely would echo Sarah's comments in relation to things like tree wardens groups acting as in intermediaries and, 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 and places for conversation to that place. There's many a time when an email has come to me through Tree Musketeers which I've managed to steer and, and, and avoid a conflict with a tree officer like Rupert, because I can say, whoa, 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 not their fault. That is, they, they don't want this tree to go. They haven't decided this. This is how this happens. This is how the planning system works. Um, or, you know, where a tree genuinely has to come out. You know, now and again, I'm kind of, you know, asked, why is this tree being felled? And I'll say, because this is going to fall over and it's on a street. You know, there are occasions where stuff's got to be done. Um, and I think this community, this development of community com communication, um, communication between the people within local authorities who care and the people within the community who care can only help. And so I would very much advocate support for tree officers. I think the London Tree Officers Association is a fantastic organization for networking London tree officers. There's also the National Municipal Tree Officers Association. Um, and I would really advocate anyone who's interested in trees in a city locally, don't necessarily kind of immediately email your tree officer and say, I want a meeting with you, <laughs> you know, can we chat? Because they might be a bit busy for that. But find a way to develop a relationship with your local authority tree officer, because they're not going to be doing that job unless they care about trees. Um, and I completely echo what uh, John and Greg have said about Greg's boss. He's a great guy. Uh, he rang me today to talk about some stuff. And, and you know, tree officers do fantastic work. Uh, and the world would be a lot worse place and we'd have a lot fewer trees without them. Here, here. Thank you, Russell. So, yes, everybody go out there and appreciate your tree officers. OK, we'll try not to keep banging on about them, but there's so much stuff that does. Look, you know, there's another question here from Alan. Um, Alan's talking about protection of local authority trees should come from fit for purpose tree strategies. I think you're absolutely right, Alan. Those are tree strategies play a big part. But as you've said in your question, most local authorities do not have enough resources to administer TPOs. They also don't have enough resources to write tree strategies or to do all those other things. So it just keeps all, I completely agree with you, Alan, by the way, not picking on you, but it's just another question that I think kind of at its heart comes back to the, uh, the tree officer issue. Um, okay, I thought we'd be able to work through all the questions, which is why I've done an even worse job of managing them than normal. But now we haven't got that much time left. We've still got lots of questions. Uh, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, well, John, could I be a bit rude and ask that we ask answer a particular question about tree wardens? I was going to ask that question, <laughs> but if you just want to crash it, um, here's just because I make this look easy, Greg, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, go on then, Greg. I'll ask you that question right now. Mary's asked a question, and a couple of other people have alluded to it as well, um, about uh, keep hearing about tree wardens, and they've been mentioned a lot tonight. Uh, how do you become a tree warden? And someone else has made a nice comment about the fact that tree wardens can often off, uh, offer a sort of additional uh, bit of communication between the local authority and the residents. So um, how do you become a tree warden? Greg, you were keen to ask it. I'm going to let you answer it. Well, I um, well, it's more because I saw it popping up and I thought it was a really great topic. Um, so the tree warden scheme has been around for quite a while, since the 80s, as far as I know, and it's run through the tree council. Um, and as, yeah, it, it seems to be like a great way of engaging members of the community to actively be involved, sort of wardening trees. Um, I know that sort of historically it's been a bit more rural, so woodland wardens. And uh, I think the 
urban tree wardens, they might be looking at a different name because there might be a bit too much confusion with traffic wardens. Um, something which I'm often confused for when I'm out doing my highways tree surveys, which always gets a bit of a shock reaction from people. But, um, yeah, I think it's one of the brilliant ways of engaging people because you've got, you've got active members of the public wanting to be involved in protecting the trees. And um, you know, given how cut back and under resourced tree officers are and can be, it's a great way to have sort of eyes and ears on the ground, sort of seeing trees that might not be, that might be struggling, early signs of pests and diseases. And also, um, someone like Roger is perhaps the best example who's doing a couple of presentations at the Urban Tree Festival. Um, he's almost reforested Wakefield by himself in terms of his, his passion for the project and um, yeah, getting people involved. And I, I think one of the ways in which the Tree Warden Scheme works well is working closely, not just with the tree officers, but the, uh, the members, the councillors themselves, I think the best way of actually setting up a tree warden network in your area is finding the friendly, I say friendly, that's perhaps the wrong term to refer to the councillors, but the councillors who are very, very keen on trees. Um, I know that John, you're perhaps a good example of a, of a, of a very tree orientated councillor, but you know, we've got a few uh, where I work who are very keen on us starting a, a tree warden scheme as well. And I think it's a great, yeah, a great way to they're you know, working with the tree council to get some people um involved in yeah, more tree. Um so I'm losing my train of thought because of my neighbour's kids. Um yeah, tree water scheme, great thing. Tree council run it, working well with the local councillors, the tree officers, and the tree council and the wardens can do really great things for uh tree management in your area. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Sarah, have you got any thoughts on tree wardens? And then I'll go to Russell for a sort of first person perspective. Yeah, tree wardens are doing a fantastic job. Um, many of them are, are also linked up with charter groups and bringing various different projects together. And Greg's all, already mentioned Roger in Wakefield, but Roger is really well connected and knows how to do good for trees in his community by dipping into various different things. But tree wardens play a really valuable role. In Sheffield, the new tree wardens group is uh, sitting under and organised by Amy, the council's contractor. And um, that's, a, that's a really great scheme where the tree wardens are now getting to know the tree officers at Amy and going out on site visits and learning how to support the tree officers in their role. So I think tree wardens can play a really valuable role between both supporting tree officers to do the public engagement and care of trees um, and speaking to other residents and bringing more people on board and, and engaged in woods and trees. So yeah, really, really important role. Thanks, Sarah. Russell, you said that when you started out, you, you got into it as a tree warden first. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so um, it, it, my partner at the time uh, kind of was looking for things for me to do because I was just about to give up law and obviously needed something else to do. Um, and she said, well, why don't you get involved with this bunch? Um, and I went along and quite liked tree people. And, um, you know, it was local local authority uh, tree officer who initiated the group. <clears throat> it was Hackney, called Hackney Community Tree Wardens. Um, and, uh, or Hackney Tree Wardens rather. And eventually um, we, we, we transformed to Tree Musketeers Primarily, um, or primarily because uh, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but basically, the, the only difference between tree musketeers and a tree warden group is that I, as a, because I, I then trained as an ARB and and you know did various qualifications. So I sit within tree musketeers as a qualified arboriculturalist. So in a sense, I perform the role that the tree officer might otherwise perform for the for the tree wardens. Um, so I think they're a fantastic group. I think that there has been a tendency for them to be a little bit kind of out of touch with certain urban communities. And I'm really glad to hear that they're re being reignited in urban communities. And I do think there is a, a thing, in, particularly in urban communities where one size does not fit all. So I would encourage everyone to set up the group that works for them, but to work with all the other groups who are in the area. So, you know, particularly the, the local authority tree officers, but Woodland Trust, Tree Council, whoever. Don't feel you have to go down the tree warden model, but it is a very useful model and it's a very useful way in which to, you know, have an, a, a potential novice role um, in trees and gradually learn. Um, so it's a very good entry level way into arboriculture. And really what I've tried to do with Tree Musketeers is do a lot of teaching 
Um, really what I'm passionate about is teaching people about trees, but not just, you know, what is that tree or, you know, um, but really how they work, you know, hence the root to crown ratio stuff and, and everything. Because the more people understand about how complex and sensitive trees are, the more chance that we're going to have sensible debates about where to go in the future. But can I just come in on that? On that, I think echoing Russell, uh, if there aren't tree warden, if there isn't a local tree wardens group, there might be other local groups who are doing uh, a range of different activity for woods and trees. And tree wardening might not be something that everybody wants to do, but there might be other sorts of activities. You know, as an individual, you care about woods and trees and want to be involved, but in a different way. So, you know, the Tree Charter Network has a wide range of groups who are doing different things. The Wooden Trust has. Um, a number of urban woodlands where we have woodland working groups that go in and do different kinds of roles. So there is something out there for everyone. Um, I know we're talking about tree officers and working with them, but there are a range of opportunities for, for kind of volunteering and engagement in woods and trees that have that wider benefit on the urban forest. Absolutely, Sarah, thanks. I think as well, one, one easy way to engage people with trees is through the watering side of it too. It's quite a, people kind of, they get that. They understand that trees need to be watered and there's some stuff on, um, like we've mentioned before the the, the Arboreal Cultural Association's Tree Care Supporter Initiative and uh, our new website treecare.org.uk and there's some watering materials on there you can actually I've got one on here this wasn't planned but there's one here but you can uh, you can print these things off and then just uh, cut them off and stick them to the trees and it just tells people why they should water them so lots of ways to engage the community um okay there's a few questions I really want to ask what I'm going to ask Greg first of all if, if Russell or Sarah have any thoughts jump in but I'll ask Greg first Rob's asked the question um about many developers currently ignoring BS 5837 legal practices with trees on development sites uh, I think Rob's got some particular cases in mind um but I don't know Greg is that something you're hearing in the sort of tree officer world is there more breaches of British standard 5837 at the moment is that down to tree officer resources I think part of it is the lack of ability to enforce breaches and contraventions. Um, I mean, right, so my main role isn't in planning. I don't do a great deal of 5837 stuff, but as far as I was aware, because it's recommendations, it's, it's a recommendation. There's not always, not every local authority might insist on one. I could be wrong on that. I know that where we are, uh, we do. but. Um, yeah, I think where councils don't have the ability to enforce it, either in the legal and enforcement team or a tree officer specialised in that post, it's, I suppose the first part is it's difficult enough to find the breaches at times. Although I've, I've seen on Rob's Twitter and Facebook posts, there's some very, very obvious and very, very bad ones, especially around veteran trees. Um, but yeah, just the resources and not being able to enforce it is difficult. And then because with trees, it can take it can take a long time for the after effects to show. It, it a, a, actually proving that that development, that breach of um, the guidance, is what caused it, can be very very difficult. And I've sadly heard of too many cases where, um, yeah, the enforcement team has just decided not chosen not to pursue it, either because of resources or they just don't think it's a it it it's a case that they can win because the developers are pretty more more powerful in many instances. Thanks, Greg. Well, while we're uh, while we're talking about people damaging trees that shouldn't be damaged, we're never ones to shy away from a difficult topic here. So I will ask a question from uh, Mark, who's asked about what are the reasons given for the felling of the trees at Sheffield. Now, uh, this has obviously been very controversial, and lots of terrible things happened. But it's you know we need to talk about these issues. It was certainly a big one. I don't know if um, Sarah, I mean you, uh, Woodland Trust were heavily involved in, in all of that. Have you got any thoughts on? on Sheffield or even a description of the background without trying to put you on the spot too much? No, I think yeah, I think I think there's a lot of learnings to come from Sheffield um, and, I, and I won't go into, into it into too much detail uh, and really uh, we're still trying to understand the, the exact reasons so um, I know a lot of the community are pushing for a public inquiry but uh, essentially it, it boiled down to the PFI contract that was signed between the council uh, and Amy the the contractor um, delivering highways maintenance. And uh, it, it was 
The trouble is with, with a contract such as that, when trees are, are covered under highways, as opposed to, uh, you know, as being cared for by tree officers, um, the highways is, you know, straight lines, uh, straight pavement, straight everything, and trees aren't considered to be the living beings that they are. And I think the, the, essentially it boiled down to uh, a PFI contract that, that absolutely did not work for trees. Thanks, Sarah. Russell, you put your hand up there. Yeah, I mean, because because I'm independent, I can jump in and say what I like. Um, I mean, really, the bottom line is this comes down to austerity as much as anything. You know, cutbacks, 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 cutbacks. Eventually, councils are going to look to save money. Amy had a loss leading contract where they said, we'll manage trees for 35 years for this. Um, and local authority got sold a duff. Now, I don't know who was responsible and I'm not kind of, you know, I'm not privy to who, who made what decision. But ultimately, if you get a multinational mega corporation running your street trees, they're likely to make a hash of it, it's particularly if they're not a specialist street tree manager. Amy got taken to the Court of Appeal by Birmingham City Council on their street, street management, not the trees, but on the streets. Because Amy said to the council, oh no, we haven't got a database for the repairs. The contract doesn't say we need to have a database, we just do the repairs. Um, and the council said, well, how are you going to do the repairs if you haven't got a database? And that, Amy actually took it to court and lost in the Court of Appeal eventually um, because private companies are answerable to their shareholders and the bottom line. They are not public servants. So they don't care in the literal sense. They don't care because they are there to serve their shareholders. They don't care how many trees go. They don't care how many um, potholes there are. They're just there to fulfill a contract. So ultimately, it is a question of whether or not you put your funds into public servants doing public good, or you put your funding into private companies and looking to make a profit. And I feel some sympathy for Sheffield in that local authorities have had to find cutbacks. And that's how these things happen. So there's a lot more to it, obviously. But ultimately, if you want an answer to why the disaster happened, that's a key part of it. Um, and of course, what Amy did being, you know, looking at the bottom line is they thought well if we fell a lot of the big trees in years one to five we've got a 25-year contract we won't have to do anything for the next 20 years because all the trees will be really young and they won't need much maintenance and i'm sorry but it is that cynical so um you know sheffield got sold a duff by a company that's a bit smarter at, you know knowing how to make money um and ultimately once you get yourself into a dodgy contract like that the private company's lawyers are going to be a lot more tooled up than the local authorities' lawyers who can't be able to get them out of it. So, you know, just be aware that when you engage private contractors to do public service, um, you're likely to get your fingers burnt, which is not to say all private companies are bad or that, you know, we don't get great service from, from, from private companies at times, but this, this is part of the picture. Thank you, Russell. Greg, I don't know if you're burning to say anything about Sheffield or if it's been covered. I can't add anything of any substance given what uh, Sarah and Russell have said, so I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> but other than that, I'm glad that the situation is resolved and they've now got a much better system in place. Yeah, just echoing that, it's really uh, looking at lessons learned and moving forward to the future. We're, we're really pleased to see the new Street Tree Partnership working really closely together to overcome the issues of the past and to develop you know the tree the tree warden scheme and to look at tree management going forward and that is all set out in the strategy that's due to be published really soon and I'd, I'd encourage everyone to take a look at that thanks Sarah and ironically you know that I'm not saying this is a, makes it a good thing but there's I think there was so much attention on Sheffield that it's actually focused the minds of many other local authorities around the country who've realized that actually trees can really kick off in a big way and you know weirdly it might have kind of helped in some ways that's not to take away from how terrible it was but um who knows i was going to say something else as well but i've completely forgotten oh. yeah no just uh, just echoing that john i think that there definitely has been ramifications elsewhere both in terms of community standing up for the trees but that wider recognition of how trees are managed and elsewhere and i think the the way that sheffield has opened up the conversations on trees and tree management ultimately is definitely a really valuable and, and a good thing Thanks, Sarah. And also that gave me time to remember what I was going to say, which I think is important, um, which is that what was going on in what we sort of say the Sheffield thing was, was very much isolated to the highways contracts. And there was a lot of good work being done by a lot of people in other parts and other departments of Sheffield 
Um, and to have the whole thing sort of tarnished by the same brush is a little bit unfair. Sheff the word Sheffield shouldn't be synonymous with battery management because there's a lot of people doing great things in Sheffield and we shouldn't let absolutely. them get sort of tied up in all of it. Absolutely, John. Uh, community forestry is absolutely fantastic and has been for a long time in Sheffield. And I think that's one of the really exciting things about the uh, the tree vitalized project um, that, that is now developing. It's It's crossing the boundaries between street trees and community forestry and doing a lot of vital work and continuing the great work that Sheffield has always done. So the new street tree strategy is a kind of uh, sits alongside the wider uh, tree and woodland strategy for Sheffield. And uh, it, it, is, it is sad when um, how in Sheffield, uh, the whole of Sheffield got tarnished with the kind of street tree uh, <laughs> uh, issue. But no, there's real great work going on. And, you know, and ultimately, I think, it comes back to that that trees and people connection and you know Sheffield has always been engaging people and it's wider woodlands and trees but it's that recognition that people need engaging in their street trees as well it you know those, those street trees are right outside people's windows it's not just about going out to a wood, lovely woodland and a park or or planting a tree you know in a in a field it's all about the trees that are close to people and often those are the ones that people are most emotive about feel passionate about and care about and you know just a small example is a lady who contacted me uh, who had had some trees heavily pollarded on her street and outside her window and she was she was actually quite distressed it completely changed the look of her street um and when I, I contacted the local tree officer to check on how my reply was, was going to be received, it was almost like, well, why is this person questioning uh, my management my management decision on those trees? And I think, so the communication's got to come from both sides, especially when it comes to, to street trees. And, you know, it being in my kind of, my position, I could say, well, this person clearly cares about the tree that's outside her window. Um, she needs to understand why that management practice is, has been made and ultimately it's, it's for the longevity of that tree. So I definitely think there's a lot of more communication to be done on both sides, um, ultimately for the good. I went off on a side tangent then from the community forestry angle, but yeah. <laughs> Quite right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, OK, well, that's interesting. That gives a little segue into the last kind of big question we're going to do to all of you. And then we're going to ask one question specifically to uh, Russell. Um, and then we're going to finish up. So a question we've had in from Graham uh, about network rail. Little disclaimer there before anyone lays in too heavily. I think I think this is our Graham who works at network rail. So we're not going to go in too heavily on Graham. But this is a good and this is kind of uh, symptomatic or symbolic of what uh, network rail are trying to do, which is re-engaging. Graham's asking, what's, the, what's your one key item of advice for network rail in developing their community engagements? There was a bit of a problem recently, network rail felling a lot of trees that a lot of people got upset about and that kind of kicked off a bit. Uh, Network Rail now looking to really improve their community engagement. What sort of one tip would you give them? Greg, I'll come to you first, then I'll go around to the others. Um, I'll start this off by saying that I've never worked in utility or boroculture and I haven't had a great deal of work with Network Rail, so there's probably a lot that they have to deal with that I have no knowledge of. Um, but one of the biggest complaints that I see is large scale tree work happening during nesting season. Um, and I don't know, well, I know that there's a lot of work that has to happen all year round because, you know, if a tree falls on the railway line, that's just a huge disaster. And as a regular commuter, it ruins my day. But, you know, the, the landowner is going to have a big problem themselves. Um, I would say, yeah, communication. Um, more than just sort of letter dropping, be it working with the local tree officers, the local planning department, the local councillors, or the local community groups to really sort of get the message out there because a lot of people don't know why the tree felling work happens on network rail. Um, I certainly don't know a great deal about it, even being in the industry, because I've never worked in you know, utilities, so I, I don't know the full story. But I'd say, yeah, trying to communicate that message as much as possible. And then if, if, if there are concessions that can be made, such as avoiding large-scale work around um, nesting season, because I, I do the Bedford St Pancras line every week, and there's been a huge amount of work going on. Um, a lot of piling work, which is actually creating quite a lot of really good standing deadwood habitat that's set back from the railway. So actually, it's, it's still creating quite good habitat for the future. But there's been a lot of blitzing work going on. Um, and like I said, I don't know the reasons why, even being in the industry. So I'd say 
communicating those reasons. If it's for safety, then making it abundantly clear. But if there are some small concessions that can be made, then perhaps looking into that as well. Thanks, Greg. Sarah? Uh, uh, advice. I think um, I keep coming back to Roger, but Roger in Wakefield uh, has planted a load of trees on a stretch of grass running alongside a railway line where Network Rail had removed a lot of trees and it actually opened up the line for uh, young people to go clambering onto the tracks. And so Roger's worked to replant a lot of trees. And I think there's a lot of learning from groups out there who are who are trying to, to do a lot of community engagement themselves. And I'd say, get out there and talk to them and, and speak to communities before taking action, before those trees come out, engage those communities that, that stand to see them lost and understand what their feelings are and, and have honest, open conversation with them and be absolutely transparent. I think it all comes down to honesty and transparency uh, right from the outset. Thanks, Sarah. Russell. Yeah, I think with a big utility like Network Rail, what I would advise them to do is work out what it is that they can achieve and then try and achieve it. So, for example, if you want to manage self-seeded sycamore on a railway line on a 10-year rotation, because once it gets that big, it might fall over, then say that's what you're doing. If what you want is mature trees set back from the railway line and a scrub layer along the railway line because you don't want any, way, any trees there because it's too important to manage that way, then say that's what you're doing. If it's better to maintain a herb layer, say that's what you're doing. I think the trouble is they don't know what it is that there is their optimum management regime because they're a utility company and their optimum management regime is the trains are running. You know, it's it, they don't the, the stuff next to the railway is not what they're managing. They're just managing the trains, and the stuff next to it is the stuff that gets in the way. So I would I, I would get them to get some advice from you know ecologists, tree people, biodiversity people who can say, okay, what are your constraints? What has to happen for this line to keep running? And therefore, what can we have next to the line that's of value that we can say to the community, we're managing this for this value. Um, and then you want a kind of clear communication, because I think the problem is it, it looks too much like, um, oh, we haven't done that line for a time, so we better just hit it. Um, and they go in and hit loads of stuff really hard all in one go. And I, I mean, I have said to people when when a lot of self-seeded stuff has been hit that maybe it's not a disaster for biodiversity because actually you'll get some scrub development. There's more light getting in there and maybe, you know, it, it won't be a, a, a net loss particularly where you've got a wider buffer and you've got some other trees that haven't been hit. But um, I think really the, the burden I would place on the utilities, like big ones like Network Rail, is you ought to have a strategy. You ought to know what it is that you're trying to achieve. And if you don't know what that is, get the advice that you need in order to, to, to decide it. And then you can stick to it and you can defend it. Thank you, Russell. All good advice, everybody. Um, Right, I just want to actually come to Russell for the last question, which I say, Russell, if you did, it's a big question, but maybe like just in a sort of minute as while we wind up. Um, I think it's a great question. Oh, sorry, actually, I was going to say as well, Mary made a really good comment in the chat uh, on that issue, which was that large scale tree work doesn't always appreciate local conditions. And I think that's very true, sort of alludes to what Russell said there as well. It's if you're just going to clear fell however many kilometres, it's not possible to get that granularity of the important local things. So, Mary, I think you're absolutely right. Um, Russell, Gary has asked, how did you actually go about starting a community project? And I'm thinking as well, kind of how do you continue, you know, 20 years of Tree Musketeers, lots of us are involved maybe now in starting community projects. How do you get that longevity and not sort of fall by the wayside as it goes along? I'm not sure I know, to be honest. Um, um, I mean, it's passion, obviously. Um, I guess I guess the, the I guess the honest answer is training, constantly learning. So I mean I'm I'm kind of I'm just an addict for learning. You know, not just trees, trying to identify every tree, but also all the insects, all the fungi, the whole lot. So you know, I'm always kind of pushing myself to learn. So that that's one of the things that keeps you going. But to be honest, another driver is knowing what's wrong, and you kind of see things happening. You see, oh God. The, those trees have been planted again and they're going to die again. I mean, literally, I have seen rows of trees get planted three times and each time they've just died because no one went back and watered them or they got strimmed. 
And so part of the, the driver is like trying to make the change. And I mean, recently I had a conversation with some people who were saying, you know, oh, I complained about this a year ago and it's still not changed. And I said, well, I've been at this for 20 years. <laughs> we're making progress. Um, it is, I think it's important to understand if what you're trying to achieve is significant cultural change, it is going to take time. It's not going to happen in a week, in a month, or even a year. Um, it takes a long time to turn around councils, to turn around issues. But the big thing that's just really in our favour now is the political climate has completely changed. Climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, you know, the agenda is around trees and is around ecology. And I think the responsibility on us now is to manage that responsibly in the sense of there's a big push for thousands, millions, billions more trees and billions more trees are not the solution to climate climate crisis you know there are much bigger political issues such as fossil fuels and reducing energy that are much much more important than planting billions of trees it's good to plant trees if they're in the right place and you're planting them well but if you're planting trees just because someone's giving you a shed load of money to do it and you put it on acid grassland or you know other valuable habitats then you're actually having a negative impact um, so I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I guess the thing is, I'm a campaigner, I'm, 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 I'm passionate, I like um, advocating things. I think the key to longevity is communication skills and partnership building. Um, I guess if I'm really honest, the early years were more me being angry and shouting at people, and the later years have been more, you know, good development of partnerships. Um, and I think, you know, you do go through that learning curve of seeing something, being angry about it and wanting it to change, and then realizing that, you know, whether you were right or wrong in the first place, and you may not even have been right in the first place, um, that it takes time to kind of gather all the evidence together and make things safe. And still, you know, the happy man tree got felled in December, you know, so it's not like everything's perfect in Hackney. Um, but I would just encourage people to follow their passion. Um, if you're passionate about something, and you're reasonable. I mean, it's, you, you do have to temper the passion a little bit um, because you want to work with people. There's only so much you can do on your own and partnership building. I think the, the world is a fantastically changed place in many respects. I mean, I think Sarah's role at Woodland Trust sounds absolutely fantastic that she's got that brief to, to, to support and, and help groups. And likewise with tree officers, you know, I'm hoping that their role is, great, is, is more widely recognized now. And there are literally thousands upon thousands of people who want to help right now. Um, and it's finding opportunities where they can do stuff. And a lot of people just want to be told what to do. They want to be told, oh, go plant that tree there now. Um, but other people have got, you know, much more now. So they'll do the fundraising or they'll do the website or they'll do the community organising. Um, so I'm sure I haven't answered your question at all, but um, <laughs> it's the best I could do, I think. You've answered any question. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Thank you, Russell. And just one comment I'll touch on very quickly from Arno, who said, brilliant presentations, good insightful discussions afterwards. It's just rather frustrating that working in a local authority often feels like being between a rock and a hard place for us at the coalface. Well, it is a rock and a hard place situation, Arno, but you're doing a great job and you're, you're fighting the, the good fight, so keep it up. Um, right, we're now going to do, we've got a minute left, we're going to rush through. There's one question I'm going to ask you, I want a one word answer. I'm going to go around, this is rapid fire. What is your favourite urban tree? Is it sweet chestnut or horse chestnut? People need to know how to vote. Greg? Sweet chestnut. Sarah? Oh, that's difficult. Uh, horse chestnut. Oh, decider. Russell? Sweet chestnut, I'm afraid. <laughs> Heartwood. Everyone go and vote sweet chestnut. Right, we have now got one last question. If your question wasn't asked, if you feel dissatisfied, if you're upset, please email me, john at trees.org.uk, and I'll try and make sure your question gets to the right place. All of our presenters get sent the chat log and all the Q&A and everything, so, so that's fine. Um, so the final question is, what is your favourite tree-related book or something-related book? We've got a pretty wide brief here. Greg, go. I'm going to cheat and go two. The Tree is a Natural History, because it was a brilliant introductory book when I started, and it's still a fantastic book now. And Tree is a, a Lifespan Approach is also a fantastic publication, which you can get as a free PDF online. You can't get a hard copy. 
Um, yeah, two wonderful books, full of information that are really useful all across your career. I absolutely agree with both of those. Thanks, Greg. Sarah? Mine's really hard, and uh, I really struggle to get a favourite, so I'm going to share the one I'm reading at the moment, which is Living With Trees by Robin Walter. Just a really great read, and uh, lots of interesting content on every aspect of living with trees and caring for trees, and really enjoying it. Thank you. And finally, Russell. I'm now going to show off what a real tree nerd I am because my favourite book, um, it's partly because I haven't got all my books with me, so I had to grab one that's here, but um, it's uh, the Sorbus Trees of the UK, White Beams, Rowans and Service Trees of Britain and Ireland. It's a BSBI publication, British uh, Bot Botanical Society of the British Isles. It's the only book that will help you identify all the sorbus trees in Britain. There's lots of micro species and they're really tricky. I'm not sure if it's still in print, but if you can get hold of it, if you like sorbus, white beams, um, that bunch, this is the book to have. Um, it's a little bit tree nerdy and specialist, but ah, lovely. Russell, in what is a very congested field, I think that is the geekiest answer we've had so far. And we all love it. That's brilliant, thank you. I'm sure everyone now kicks off saying, ah, what book was it? We don't know. Drop me an email. I've jotted them down and I can let you know what it is. There we go. Well, look, I think, I think we're done. That's it. What a great evening. Um, thank you to our speakers. You've all been marvellous. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, inspirational stuff for, for your great answers to all the questions as well. Thank you to everybody out there in webinar land watching us. Your support is appreciated as always. Hopefully we'll see you next week um, for Tracy Chevalier and Jonathan Drury, um, which should be a really interesting one as well. Go and check out the Urban Tree Festival. Go and vote in the Urban Tree World Cup. All those things that I've told you to do, just go and do them. You know it makes sense. Have a lovely evening. Stay safe and we will see you soon. Good night.